as I just mentioned, I'm finishing up work on a new book called Lighting the Sacred Fire. And that book is all about practice. And the very end of that book, I thought, would make a good uh, opening prayer for this group meeting. And since we've been opening with a prayer, I thought I would uh, read it to you. And uh, I wrote this really inspired by my own deep gratitude for my own journey and where it's led me. And so that's where this comes from. We are deeply blessed by all those who have gone before us, by all their efforts in practice, by all their suffering, and all the things they went through for the sake of peace, happiness, and illumination. We are deeply blessed by all who came to the end of their path and realized the truth. And we are deeply blessed by all who have pointed toward it. There is a kinship among all people because all are on this journey, whether they know it or not, and because all beings are one being. The smallest kindness and every ounce of effort is of immense significance because even the most insignificant chain of causation leads to all beings everywhere and to everything throughout all time. Do not for a second underestimate the gifts we have received, the great spiritual teachings and the awakening they point toward are nothing short of a miracle. Until enlightenment dawns, take refuge in this great spiritual community, in those beings who appear before us and in the great spiritual teachings. Put forth effort in your own path and in your own practice. Throw out your selfish and deluded hopes, dreams, and ambitions. Cast aside your unfounded fears. Cultivate a sense of selflessness, compassion, and equanimity. Within spiritual practice, the path is shown, but we can't merely regard it with admiration. We have to actually walk the path and put the teachings into practice. Only then can we discover for ourselves where it leads. May our practice and these teachings benefit all beings, and may they lead you to true peace, true happiness, and true illumination. Do not hesitate to walk toward or into the truth itself. The great gate is wide open. Uh, let's start with a bit of meditation. So sit upright with good posture. Inhale and exhale through the nose. For this meditation, it's a good idea to try it with the eyes closed, but it could be done with the eyes to open as well. Scan the body head to toe for any signs of tension, pain, discomfort, or unbalance anything that seems to stick out. Wherever you find a spot of tension, on the inhale, breathe into it. And on the exhale, relax that spot. Redistributing any residual tension to support your good posture. Now scan for any tension in the mind, any lingering stress from the day, any worries or troubling thoughts or emotions. 
any thoughts of the past or future, near or far. On the inhale, breathe into those mental and emotional tensions. And on the exhale, let them go. Good. Now breathe freely and focus the awareness on the breath. There's no need to count. Just follow each inhale and exhale. With each inhale and exhale, allow the body to become more and more relaxed and allow the mind to become more and more spacious, not grasping on to anything. If you're distracted by a thought, sensation, or emotion, just note what it is, that it's just a thought or just a sensation, and so on. And gently bring the awareness back to the breath. Good. Now just allow the breathing to take care of itself and turn your attention to the relaxed spaciousness and to the various thoughts that arise, move, and subside within it. Just observe this space. Note whatever thoughts arise. See how they spontaneously appear and disappear. When one thought disappears and before the next thought arises, there is a kind of gap, however seemingly small. Try to see and rest in this gap, however briefly, this peaceful quiescence between thoughts. That's all. Be patient. There's no reason to rush thoughts away, and there is no reason to be dismayed when the next thought arises.
Okay. Now let everything just be as it is. Let go of directing your attention or trying to do or see anything. Just be aware, that's all. Thoughts may arise and subside. Sensations may come and go. Emotions may swell and dissipate. But behind it all is this peaceful quiescence. It is ever present. There's no need to let go of anything. And there's no need to chase after anything either. Everything is fine, just as it is. As we conclude the meditation, don't rush. Take note of how you feel. If you feel relaxed, at ease, or at peace, try to make note of this feeling and carry it forward through the evening and into your everyday life. Just take a moment and note this feeling. So today's topic is uh, the, the mind, nature of the mind. And um, I don't know, maybe some people wonder why is it important to understand the mind? And I think uh, maybe that's just best summed up in saying that the mind causes us a lot of trouble. And if you pay attention, you'll see, you'll see that you know your mind is uh, really involved with all of your problems and uh, perceived difficulties and troubles. And so, understanding the mind is a let's say at least a potential uh, to unraveling this uh, suffering or these problems or these difficulties. So. Uh, if we ask ourselves, what is the nature of the mind or of mind, I would say it's a really big question. Uh, and like all big questions, the more one delves into it, the bigger it gets. Until really, it seems to encompass everything, all phenomena and what lies beyond all phenomena. And for that reason, maybe some of you have heard me say that the mind is nothing at all. Uh, see, it, it's nothing in particular. So the more we try to pin down what the mind is, the more it defies any limitation we try to put on it. Of course, that makes it difficult to talk about. What isn't the mind might be a more pertinent question, but either way, uh, this investigation into the nature of the mind uh, is a uh, you know part of or can be a spiritual practice. 
uh, and can lead one to greater um, peace and liberation. So, you know, in general, we tend to be identified with an idea of the mind as our interior mental states, processes, and experiences. An individual mind, sort of, you know, what you might consider the ordinary idea of what people think of when they think of their mind. And importantly, we consider the world as separate from that. The mind is what's going on in here, or what uh, happens in the, the dark expanse between our ears. You know, that's the, what we think of as the mind, and the world is separate from that. In other words, while the mind may perceive, contemplate, and comment on the world, it is not the world itself. It's something separate. That's generally how we see things. And that is, you know, uh, a sort of dualistic way of seeing things. The world is something different than what the mind is or what consciousness is. But if we begin to deeply question where this inside ends and where the outside begins, our idea of the mind struggles to remain coherent. For all seemingly exterior phenomena, all objects, the entire world really only takes shape and name through mind activity. And if you watch your mind, you can see that that's the case. You can uh, test it out. At the very least, what is perceived outside is intricately dependent on mind activity. And at the most, it's nothing but mind activity. So where does this mind come from? What is its origin and where does it exist? Can it be apart from reality? Even our general conception of the mind acknowledges that it arises in and in the context of this world that we experience. Can this inside be anything other than what is real? Is the supposed mind not simply a function of the world that we perceive? So the more we go into this question, the more it may become apparent that something very strange is going on in this life experience that we've been having. Because the world arises in the mind. And the mind arises in the world. The inside and the outside are like two sides of the same coin. They're dependent on each other. They share the same reality. So if we're investigating the nature of mind, we must go beyond the general conception of what it is and what it isn't, and look for that unified reality behind and permeating all phenomena, both inside and outside. We might think of the, the experiential mind or the individual mind like uh, a wave on the surface of an ocean, right? This is a common uh, metaphor. And we can be kind of spellbound and tossed about by the undulating surface of that wave but what we're really looking for is the boundless depths and really the nature of water itself in the context of this metaphor. So that's the rationale behind the meditation that we did of looking into the gaps between thoughts. We're looking for insight into that underlying reality. Why look between the thoughts? Uh, because we're generally, we're captivated by the thoughts. And that's what we focus on. And 
we lose sight of the background. Even though it's it's there, even when the thoughts are present, uh, we lose sight of it. And, and really our attachment to identification with and belief in our present thoughts creates and sustains the limited worldview that obscures that background. And to be clear, as I said, the thoughts themselves are not really the issue. It's that cycle of attachment, identification, and reflexive belief in them that needs to be transcended or seen through. So looking into the gaps, seeing thoughts as only thoughts, and dropping thoughts are all practices aimed toward trying to gain insight into this underlying reality or the background from which thoughts, uh, upon which thoughts appear, from which they seem to arise, and into which they seem to disappear. So that gap is the same in a lot of ways as deep sleep which we can treat as uh, just another gap. That's why I'm always uh, talking about deep sleep as an avenue for potential inquiry and insight. It's just this natural gap when all of your thoughts drop away, fall away. Finally, and this is again why uh, it's interesting to consider deep sleep, is it may be helpful to consider these thoughts as all phenomena, not just the sort of mental phenomena we generally think of as thoughts, but all phenomena we can uh, think of as thoughts. So we tend to think they're they're, uh, a particular kind of mental phenomena, but really um, we can consider all subjects and objects self and world, ideation and emotion, uh, they all can be considered as thoughts taking form and name through mental activity. Our whole lives really are like like a fleeting thought arising from uh, that background that uh, some say nothing, some say everything, some say consciousness itself, and dissolving back into it. And we may gradually come to understand the nature of mind as that from which thoughts themselves arise. And also the apparent contrast may also suddenly dissolve erasing even the distinction between thinking and not thinking. For this clear, luminous, untroubled, pure consciousness, what we can maybe call the one mind, is always present in every possible state. That the wave that we talked about is never separate from the depths of the ocean. They're one in the same reality. And that one reality is really uh, what I'm always trying to point toward, what I'm always trying to, you know, the direction, I'm always trying to move the, the dialogue or the conversation. So with that in mind, uh, I'll ask you kind of, you know, the idea here is to gain some kind of insight or to build a bridge between whatever it is that you may think of as your mind, individual mind, and this larger reality or larger mind. To see that the individual and the, or the particular and the non-particular are not separate are one and the same, really. So, um, yeah, I guess we'll take a few questions if anybody has questions. Mm 
Yeah, I'll try and you, you sort of address this, but I'm going <clears> to. <throat> The word mind, hang on. Do you need me? Yeah, I'm just going to say, you know, can it be going to see sound of freedom without you? Yes. Sorry. Um, we we use the word, we tend to use the word mind. Like, we're using the mind as, like, consciousness itself, the mind, mind, world, reality. Um, but in the common vernacular, we talk about our mind. Right. And, and the reason I'm bringing that up, I mean, you could just say, well, that's a misuse of words or something, but there seems to be, uh, is, I'm going to put this out like a question, a relationship, my mind, my thinking process, my, you know, observational, emotional, relational process with what seems to be outside, seems to have a relationship, seems to have a relationship with mind itself that's different than uh, when I walk on the grass and I'm just feeling the ground, or I'm feeling the air, or I'm just directly experiencing without thought. Uh, mind seems to have a, I'm, 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 I'm trying to draw a big picture on which you can comment or a palette on which you can paint. Uh, it almost seems like a creative process, like what I think about things or how I experience things and what the, the me that's experiencing it, that seems to be more than just experience itself. It seems to be an additional thing, which my mind is inextricably linked with. I've never really tried to thought this out before, but as you were speaking of it, it's like there's something about mind and my mind that are more tied than mind and my feet, seemingly. So I don't know if I asked that clearly. I, I haven't thought of this before exactly, but well, I mean, there's a couple of different things in there. One, there's just this issue of words, you know, and uh, to be honest, I'm addressing the mind because that's the topic of the evening. <laughs> See, we, we could, we, we could, we could choose a different word, <laughs> we could, you know, and uh, but again and again, when addressing the spiritual path you end up investigating the particular only to discover the non-particular. So if you investigate your particular mind deep enough, what you will discover is that it has no limit. And when you discover that it has no limit, you realize that larger mind in which everything appears, including the particular mind. In the same way that we see, uh, for example, we have an idea of an individual self, right? The, the doer and the thinker and so on, right? We have this idea, but when we realize that the true nature of self is nothing but reality itself, that it's not limited, suddenly we see this particular idea of self as illusory, right? That's the kind of way it's phrased. And, and we see the larger reality as the true self. And it would be better to not use the same words like self and self, you know? It would be very different words, though, because it's, it, it's part of the problem of discussing it. Is but you the, run, see, you run into the same problem. If you do that, if you use a different word, like let's say I say, uh, okay, this, so here's a common example. Uh, we could say the mind is something particular. It's it's the the individual ego self, the tangle of thoughts that that we think we are. Uh, we call that the mind. Okay, and then the larger reality we could call something else, like consciousness itself, or pure consciousness, or reality itself, or you choose your terms, right? The problem with using uh, that that arises is that you will start to think that this larger reality is also something particular. Hmm. That's the I think maybe the benefit of using the same word. It hmm. forces you 
to wrestle with the word itself and to see mm. that the reality and the idea, the concept are not the same. And so you really have to look to the reality itself rather than rely on a concept or a, a grasp a concept, even if it's a big concept, see? So I think that's why there's so much confusion with words in the spiritual discourse is that uh, there's no there's no right word to use for this all-encompassing truth. So we struggle to come up with a word for it. And, and when when we start to turn it into something particular, we have to invent a new word, you know, and so on. And, and that could go on indefinitely. So, you know, uh, eventually we end up seeing, well, look, we just see this pattern over and over. There's the small limited self and the big unlimited self, the small limited mind, the all encompassing mind. You know, there's consciousness as in conscious awareness. We talk about consciousness as like just being awake and aware, but there's also consciousness itself without any content. Uh, so this pattern just appears again and again. So when talking about the mind, you know, that's the agenda is to see past the individual particular mind, to see that that is, is only a bundle of thoughts repeated over and over. And to see this larger, when, when to see this larger mind, to put the individual mind in context, well, you see, well, it's nothing at all. It's just a bundle of thoughts. The mind itself is just an idea that we have. Hmm. It, it 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 you could say for example as as i did in in the talk that thoughts are all phenomena so the mind itself is just a thought it's just an idea that we have and we have that idea over and over and point to it as uh what we what we think we are and what we identify with we say i'm that i'm that bundle of thoughts I'm that repeating sensation in the body. I'm that, um, I'm that emotion. And we just keep doing that. So the, the question is, or the, the practice is to try to see beyond that, just the repetition of thoughts about the mind or about all the individual things to see what is the background in which all of this is happening, including the, the individual mind, right? But if you see that the, the mind is just a thought, then you can start to, again, if you're looking between the thoughts or looking for, that's a way of just sweeping all thoughts aside. What's present when no thoughts are what is there when no thoughts are present? That's why deep sleep is interesting. That's why the gap between thoughts is interesting. Um, that's why seeing thoughts as only thoughts is interesting. See, because you can dismiss them. You can just say, well, that's just a thought. That's the purpose of that kind of noting practice in meditation where you, 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 you know, may you become distracted by something you say, that's a thought. And then, and then you return your attention to see you're just dismissing it. It's just a thought. It's just a sensation. And so on. It's not that we have to reject thoughts altogether or reject sensation or reject the body or any of these things. It's just a way to try to gain insight into the underlying reality, the underlying uh truth that doesn't rely on thoughts. What I found helpful in our talks uh, this week, Matthew, was the notion of observing thoughts as though they were rising on a screen, mm. looking across it 
and then fading out and then pay attention to the screen and not the thought. I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about, you know, that. Yeah, yeah this is a pretty common common teaching and I think it's a good one. Um, in, yeah, I mean, that's what I mean, for example, when I say the background. You know, like in your meditation, for example, you you know, the first sort of task is just to see, can I watch my thoughts without being carried away with them, without, you know, being uh, dominated by them? Can I just watch them and see what they do and see how they arise and fall? That's like, you know, level one, <laughs> you know. Then the next thing to do is to start to try to pay attention to the context. What is the, uh, as, as Bruce was saying, what is the screen upon which these thoughts appear? Like images. And incidentally, you can do this same thing with images, even with whatever is in front of you while you're meditating. You see the visual field, right? It's an image. But upon what is it? projected. Where does this image appear? And so that's the the direction to see that everything that appears, be it the, an image, a sensation, a thought, it's all appearing on this screen, metaphorical, metaphorical screen, right? Like, a, you, you know, like you imagine a, you know, the movie theater, there's the screen and the image is projected on that. So we become, we're really interested in the images. But we we essentially we ignore the screen. In the movie theater, that's maybe for good reason. <laughs> you know, the, the images are the good part, right? <laughs> but in life, the uh, both are uh, important, and especially if one is on this path, seeking the truth, seeking reality, seeking something upon which one can uh, rely unequivocally, something which could never be overturned, never be disproven, never be, uh, uh, never fail you. <laughs> you know, never, it's not an idea or a concept or an argument. It's, it's the reality. And and so if that's what we're looking for, this truth, then the screen is very important because that's the background upon which everything that we are experiencing, all the, the lights and shadows and sounds and shapes and feelings and uh, all of those things are appearing in, uh, in, on this screen. And the screen is not something, really. <laughs> no, yeah, no, that's why I say it's, you know, it's just a metaphor. So it's, it's, it's a it's screen. Not like, yeah, it's not, it's not two-dimensional, yeah. and it's not anything in particular. If you, if you think it's anything in particular, ask yourself, where is that appearing? What is the context of that? So it has to be non-particular permeating everything without limit anything that would appear or that you could imagine anywhere can only appear or be imagined because of this uh underlying uh reality another reason why the metaphor might be um incomplete is that uh when we look at it as like a movie screen, like the, the projector is a projector showing on the screen and that's where the action is happening. But in, in this context, the screen, what we're calling the screen is is also the projector. In, right, in a, right, right. 
Yes, yes. And and you're not looking at the screen. You also are an image on the screen. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so you have to go deeper into that metaphor. You're, you're not just sitting in the theater. You're a participant in the movie, you know. And so everything is a, a part of the <laughs> the metaphorical movie, you know. Um, so, yeah, the metaphor only goes so far. It's it, you know, it's just an idea to give you an idea of, you know, this notion of looking for what is the underlying reality of your mind, of thoughts, of experience, of uh, whatever it is that you're experiencing. And to really look for it for oneself rather than. Uh, rely upon an idea or a concept of, about what's going on. And Matthew, I want to not pass over like I have for months of talking with you tonight, the um, consideration of deep sleep. Um, so, I, you know, Matthew has sort of said many times, consider the experience, what is your reality, when you're in deep sleep. And what I've always said is, well, that's pretty silly because I'm in deep sleep and I'm, you know, there's no Bruce there. There's no thoughts. I don't, nothing is happening. And he goes, yes, that's the important thing, Bruce. <laughs> that's precisely why it's so interesting. That's why it's so interesting. And, 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 um, when I, when I, um, look for or experience that screen which is really nothing it's 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 in many ways when i try to experience in meditation deep sleep those two are are the same yes yeah yeah i think you know that's why that's why uh um you know, this experience of all the all the different all our different states has things to teach us, you know, and that's why deep sleep is so interesting, because in this state of deep sleep, uh, all the normal things that we pay attention to, the, the mind, the body, the thoughts, the visual field, um, sensations, everything goes away. Everything, all particular things fall away. And and yet people instinctively enjoy it. They enjoy sleeping. And when they awake from deep sleep, they say, ah, I slept so well, you know? And when they're tired, they say, I can't wait to go to sleep. And yet from the experiential side, they completely ignore it as if it's a non-experience, a non-state. because there's no really time there, no space, uh, no nothing, as they say, you know? And so people just ignore it entirely. But I think this is, a, you know, it's an opportunity for insight. You know, I often say, look, enlightenment isn't that complicated. It just doesn't leave anything out. So, uh, you know, deep sleep, points toward this consciousness itself, this consciousness without objects, without subjects, without a self, an individual self, without um, any particulars. Every morning, if you watch, when you wake up in the morning, you have to remember who you are and recall everything that's going on and basically recreate the entire world in your mind. And then you can get up and go have breakfast and so on. And it uh, and when at night when you go to bed, as you drift away, all of those things start to fall away, start to drop off. And you know, likewise, uh, speaking of states, you know, the dream state also has a lot to teach us because in dreams we see all of these images and while we're wrapped up in the dream, we take them to be uh, what they are and we get involved in them. You know, we have conversations with people in our dreams. We, 
uh, you know, run away from scary things. We chase after good things. We uh, have experiences and, and uh, all kinds of things can happen in the dreams. But, you know, when you wake up from the dream, you think, uh, oh, it was just a dream. It wasn't real. See, it was just a projected image upon the screen. So what screen is this image projected on? And what happens when you wake up from this dream? Walker, yeah. Um, Matthew, I can uh, infer the presence of that screen or the deep ocean. Um, but I'm curious about the deep ocean or the screen actually experiencing itself without any content. And uh, that, uh, you know, is beyond me. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, with regard to practice, I would point first to this practice of looking between thoughts of just trying to get a sense of that gap uh, when one thought falls away, but before the next one arises. Um, and, you know, uh, if you do this in meditation, the more and more you do it, you can start to work with dropping thoughts so that you can drop them sooner and sooner. So basically what you're trying to do is to widen this gap so that you can linger in that uh, space between thoughts longer. If possible, if you, if you can stop all your thoughts, even for a moment, uh, this could lead to deep insight. And is there something there that says On the screen, now on the deep ocean, what is there that <laughs> identifies that it's in that experience? Yeah, this is, uh, this is a good question. See, because when you really see that, there's nothing particular there except uh, awareness but not see, not of any particular thing. It's just uh, awareness without any source or object. In other words, it's like, imagine if you were in deep sleep, but somehow you were aware. So it's a, uh, there aren't any objects there. The the self, you know, you're not, you don't perceive yourself as a body or a mind or anything like that. You're you are that empty space. And there's no uh, even to call it a space is is too much. See. And it's timeless. So if you're in that state, uh, it will, uh, no time will pass. If, if you come out of it, for example, you will not know how much time it had passed. And so, um, Yeah. Yeah. I think I heard you say uh, awareness without content and without any source. Yes. Is, 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 so there's that, no, in normal, normally we think of like the, we identify this, the source of our awareness as the subject, right? It's, it's us, you know, I, I am the thinker. 
but since there's no there's no thoughts, there's no thinker. Uh, that that's helping me a lot. That that you threw in the word source, no source and no content, and uh, I'm yeah, gonna, I'm gonna yeah. Whenever that. it like yeah, there's there's uh, it's like <laughs> I often use the word nothing. There's, there's nothing there. But nevertheless, one could be aware of this nothing. See, so who who is aware of it? You know, it's this is a it's a puzzling question. And and in the end, you know, we can only discover these things for ourselves. You know, like uh the 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 teachings point toward it and practices are an aid to discovering it, but we have to, you know, try and look and see what we find. As you're talking, I realize that uh, to me, the question is like, what is it that could be aware of nothing? You know, normally we think of awareness as like, well, I'm aware of things. I'm aware, that's what awareness is. But what you're essentially saying is that's not what awareness is. Awareness is, everything even if it's not aware of something it's still aware yeah 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 this you can trace it back so like look uh we could play a little linguistic game where we say i am uh you know the perceiver or <laughs> say uh and i'm perceiving the world and we can just dial or we can just dial it all back. See, we get rid of the world, first of all. Now we just say, I am the perceiver. Uh, you know, or we say, you know, basically what I'm trying to get at is you just go back and back. You know, if you cut words off, you get to I am. See, if you cut the am off, you just get to I. What's before the I? That's that's kind of what I'm talking about. Before even the I arises, there is this, uh, well, it's the source of everything. Walker, the way I experience the source is it feels very local. It feels like it's, it's me. And uh, I don't know if that's when, when you, when you're speaking of the source that you're, you're still identified with the, that sort of ident uh, identified with yourself. Um, and it's almost impossible for me. To, it, maybe it is impossible to delocal delocalize that self that that experience um so I don't, i'm not sure if that's what you're referring to as the source you know the the this localization aspect is itself just a thought say we you know we orient ourselves in space and identify with a particular view and imagine that our awareness is localized somewhere in our head. Right. But we're aware of all of this. So I have a couple, maybe we'll try a couple exercises. I struggled to come up with exercises that would, you know, try to point toward um, breaking down this distinction between outside and inside, between not mind and mind, or uh, the, uh, yeah. Anyway, I struggled a bit to f figure out uh, an exercise. So we're going to do a couple of things. They're just, um, you, might, you might think they're kind of, uh, they're like uh, little, um 
exercises that attempt to manipulate your awareness uh, and your attention and where it in where it is and how you perceive it. So, uh, and we'll see if it has uh, if you what you experience, and then we'll we'll talk afterwards. So the first one is uh, just close your eyes and then open your eyes and look at whatever is in front of you and see how when you close your eyes, your attention goes inward. Almost like it's reflecting off the back of your eyelids. And when you open your eyes, suddenly the attention leaps outward to focus on or perceive whatever seems to be out there. Just open and close your eyes a couple of times and see if you can detect any perceptible contrast in the feeling of your, obviously there's a contrast between what you're seeing, but in the feeling of your attention or your awareness. Closed, open. You might experience uh, some difference in tension around the eyes. especially if you turn your awareness more and more inward. And when you open your eyes and look out, the eyes may relax unless you focus intensely on something. And if you focus intensely on something, notice that the attention and awareness goes out Can everybody experience just some difference? Doesn't have to be much. Just some, just notice any difference between what your awareness feels like with the eyes closed and with the eyes open. Okay, so the next thing uh, I want you to try to do is close your eyes. Have that feeling of how the awareness is with the eyes closed, aware of inside. See, aware of that dark personal mind area. And in a moment, open your eyes, but try not to let the the awareness jump outward at the world. Try to uh, hold it back. In, in that to have that same feeling of keeping the awareness inside, but allow your eyes to open and for the visual field to arise. Good. So if you've got a sense of that, now uh, do the opposite. So look outward at something and allow the gaze, the eyes to relax and the gaze to just the attention and awareness to go out, outward. And then gently close your eyes, but keep the awareness 
expansive outward. Good. Now see if you can just balance the two. Keep inside and outside present. Undivided. Now you can explore the same thing with your breathing. So when you inhale, the attention goes inward into the body, and when you exhale, goes out. See if you can get the feel for that. In, tension goes in, exhale, tension goes out. In, out. outside. If you can get a sense of the attention moving with the breath, uh, going inside on the inhale and outward and outside on the exhale, now see if you can uh, reverse. So now as you inhale, let the attention go out. And as you exhale, allow it to come in. Finally, just watch the breathing without controlling it in any way whatsoever and be aware of both inside and outside in a way that unifies them as one whole, one experience.
allow the awareness to become decoupled from the breath, such that, see, the breath is just something that's appearing within it. You can just watch it. So, you know, what these little exercises are getting at is to try to give you an experience uh, that, uh, or to sort of um, give you an insight into how your experience is coupled or connected to everything that's going on. And by manipulating it or changing it, you can see that it's not necessarily uh, one way or the other way. One way may feel uh, more natural, but that's just because you're that's what you're used to doing and that's how we're doing it, you know? So, uh, you know, this may seem totally irrelevant to you, in, in terms of the discussion of the mind. Um, but uh, I think these exercises are very interesting because they show us that, um, well, really, you know, you start to see that everything is happening within awareness, even the movement. The, the the different movements and things like that. We think we are that movement, but actually, no, you're aware of all, all of this is happening within a larger awareness. And that it's only because we identify with certain sensations that we start to uh, sort of lock ourselves into one particular view. So finally, I'll just ask, you know, like a question, just take a, a few seconds and ask yourself this image that you're seeing in a way it could stand in for, you know, all of our experience. Here we are seeing this image that's in front of us. Where is it? Where is this image? Where is your mind? Is your mind anything other than this image? I found when you were having us like open and close our eyes that uh, I experienced if I locked onto something or if I focused on a particular thing, it's as if I be, I went to the thing. I became that thing. But I wasn't I, watching the thing or, or even the movement. Like th that, that was, <laughs> but if I didn't do that, if it was just sort of left it sort of kind of vague and just, watching watching but not i could sort of hover in the middle but as soon as i looked at any not trying to as soon as i looked at a thing the looking at the thing became that is what my attention is not just what it's doing that was really interesting yeah i mean this, this, this thing, is, i don't know if you if you can relate to it is relevant this is like so relevant yeah yes yes it's all good see see doing these types of things it seems a little weird right but uh, it just it has this potential to give us insight into what is the mind doing 
that creates this experience that we're having. And just by doing something very simple like this, you can start to explore, uh, you know, what's going on, see what's going on. And uh, you may you may find it's not exactly what you thought was going on, or you know, it's uh, you just notice you notice new things. See. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Let's let people who haven't said anything yet speak up. Yeah. Paul. Paul, yeah. Now, when you had your awakening, were you suddenly able to see how identification had occurred previously with you? In other words, oh, I see what was happening. I see how identification was occurring. No, that's a. This is like an intellectual process. Yeah, it comes later. In the moment, you just. Okay. Yeah. So it comes later. And it, this see, is a... see this idea of identification and so on. This is a way to try to explain to others, to point beyond identification, you know? Yes, it's obvious, you know, what what's obvious is that um, there's no inside or outside. There's just this uh, one reality that's both inside and outside. It's like the the symbol of the Ouroboros. Do you know this symbol? It's a very ancient symbol of a snake eating its own tail. See, in that way, the inside and the outside are the same. See, I'm seeing the world. Out of the world, my body grows my eyes grow, my mind grows, and now I'm seeing the world. See, it's a continuous, that's why I call it total perception. See, you, there's no end to it. There's nowhere for this experience to rest. There's no ground upon which we can place it. And, and because of that, that's uh, and that reality that is without inside or outside is all there is. There are no distinctions. Everything is that. So in that sense, one realizes, uh, for example, there is no individual self. You know, that's the Buddhist teaching of Anatman, no self, right? But... Uh, you also realize there are no objects. In the same way that there is no individual self, there are no objects. All objects are only that, that one reality. And because there are no objects, what is there to identify with? Hmm. So you see everything as oneself, as not separate. as one being, one reality. And, uh, you know, the idea of explaining that we become identified with uh, things in our body and our mind and so on is a way to try to explain, you know, how it is that we could lose sight of this reality, <laughs> you know? how it is that we could become lost like that, that we could uh, um, misplace this fundamental truth of being. And so, yeah, because I, you know, it was like, uh, how could you not notice that? 
see when you when you see, when you see that screen that reality you, you how could you not see it it's the, it's everywhere so that's the thing it's like uh uh you know a fish suddenly realizing water how how did how did i not know you know so that's that's how i would i would describe and the, the all in the distinction for example between inside and outside uh in my experience uh vanished and so that's why i think that these uh inquiries into insight what is inside and what is outside what are the limits of the inside what are the, where does the inside end and the outside begin you know we're drawing that limit all the time through mind activity and that limit wherever you draw it it's a constantly if you watch you'll see it's a constantly shifting limit what is inside you know is your hair yours or is it outside you you know um so we're constantly shifting it around in terms of the what we're aware of physically but also what we think we're uh doing or not doing you know uh i'm doing this uh but i'm not doing that over there why you know i just it's just investigate these these what are these limits because prior to my awakening that was one of the things i was investigating is what is the limit of myself and the more i looked into it the more i discovered that there was no limit that i could identify and when i looked for where my mind was what i discovered is it was it was everywhere it was no different than the world i was looking at it wasn't something other than the world so that's the reason for all these kind of uh avenues of inquiry that makes sense yeah my follow up is but we have this term we use uh identification to as a way to try to describe something that seems to happen where we believe i For me, and I don't know if this is true for others, I'm guessing it might be though, when I feel most strongly. You cut out there, Paul. Audio. Yeah. There you go. Okay, I don't know how that happened. Sorry. Right. When I feel most strongly I is when I'm feeling pain of some kind, especially emotional pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is sort of the origin of my question, like, what the heck is happening there? <laughs> it's hurting, I mean, emotionally. And it's like, all right, this is like the real me. This is, this is, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I realize that's, that's, that's good. Cool, that's... But, but for whatever reason, it, it feels that way, that, that uh, I'm most strongly identified when there's pain. Yeah, this is why pain can be a great gift um, and that we should take it as an opportunity for practice. Uh, and I'll tell you what one of my teachers told me, which was very helpful, um, was um, remind yourself when this pain arises and this feeling of self becomes so powerful uh don't feel sorry for yourself don't make the pain personal 
Because as soon as you start feeling sorry for yourself, as soon as you start making it personal, it's mine, uh, it, it becomes worse, for one thing. <laughs> so you can, if you, if you try this, you can see that it's not as bad, and that's insight. Then you can continue to to practice. But the the basic idea is to uh, don't feel sorry for yourself, and to see that when you're really suffering from pain, it's due to this feeling sorry for yourself to some great degree. Yeah. And if it's uh, if it's particularly troublesome, you can uh, try to find a a prayer or a mantra or something like that that will uh, give context to this pain and not allow you to fall into that vortex of self pity. Yeah. And so it's okay to feel sad, but don't feel sad about your sadness. That's right. Yes. Yeah. It's okay to feel pain, but yeah, don't feel uh, uh, that it's um, something to be ashamed of or that it's uh, that it's so personal. But yeah, that's a good way to put it. It's okay, especially with emotions. It's okay to be sad. Just don't be sad about being sad. Just be sad. It's okay. You know, be feel the pain. It's all right. Look, look at the pain. See it for what it is. You know, it's only it, it, because pain is so acute. We immediately become wrapped up in it. It's it, you know, it's very similar to like when in meditation when you're watching thoughts. You know how see a thought can kind of catch you, and then it, it you get sort of taken away with it. Or like Mark was saying, you focus on something and now you're that. It, your attention goes straight to it and now you're carried away with that thought or that idea uh, and so on. And uh, pain is like that. It's sharp and it just catches you right away. And then you're you're in that um, sort of uh, personal space. Identification, like you said, Paul. Ident identification, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The physical pain, you know, maybe I haven't had really bad physical pain. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I have. But the worst pain for me is is emotional. Yeah. And and it's, you know, this, this is a very old thing and I'm sure it's true for many people but when when I feel and Matt and I've, I've written you about this um, when I feel wrong in some way or that I'm somehow and and I haven't had this experience lately but oh, I'm, I'm I'm just wrong I'm something's defective or something mm -hmm. is is just fundamentally messed up about me and then there's emotion attached to that. And it's and it that is like the worst pain there is that I know of. Yeah. Is that shame? Shame is there. Yes. It's a, yeah, it's a whole, <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, it's a whole I problem. mean, it can this kind yeah, this kind of pain can be very deep. It just it's it's uh like wound through our whole being. And uh it can have all kinds of uh tendrils going different places in the mind and different places in the body. Uh, so, yeah, if you pray, pray <laughs> and uh, try not to feel sorry for yourself. It just makes matters worse, you know. And so it, the other, you know, I do give also a specific practice for um, processing pain. And it's very simple. The first thing to do is to focus on your breathing. to calm yourself down, right? Because it's, it can come on so strong that you're overwhelmed by it. So remind yourself to breathe and try to calm yourself down with the breathing a little bit. Then it's just accept what's happening. 
that the pain is already there. It's arisen. Whether it's emotional or physical is irrelevant. It's there. You're feeling it. It's okay. So accept that it's there and that you're feeling it and feel it. And, and then the third step is to really look at it. Uh, what I call kind of direct gazing. Don't try to, you know, turn your face away from it. Just look at what that feeling is. See it as a feeling, as a sensation. And, um, you know, that's a way to try to be with it without feeling like you have to uh, panic or get away or um, to just try to be find some level of comfort as hard as it may sound within that painful experience that painful situation yeah Help them out. The comment about it not being personal yeah this to me was great advice mm -hmm. uh don't feel sorry for yourself and try not to make it personal mm -hmm. um and and also, you know, the other thing that is very helpful is to see that these things pass. It's like a, a wave. And the wave will break and pass. And so see that all these um, painful thoughts and emotions and so on are themselves impermanent, temporary and passing. Good question. Yeah. Any that good? Yeah. Okay. One hand is up. Oh, Kaizen. Yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, this is uh, something we've dealt with a lot. <laughs> right, Kaizen, Kaizen is the teacher who told me this good advice by the way <laughs> <laughs> um but one of the things that and you you've implied it but one of the things i just want to specify right because sometimes it helps people clarify it is this aspect of like how do you avoid the, the identification with the self-pity um it's judgment right that's the thing that's the source of the self-pity it's judgment Right. And it doesn't matter if it's physical pain or emotional pain, whatever. If you start to judge it in any way, you will start to identify. You have to simply witness it and that's it and accept it like, OK, that's what's going on and, and release the judgment out of it. Right. Um, because that's going to decide this kind of good, bad dynamic that's going to decide all these different things. Right. Um, and so it has to be a release of judgment. Um, and this this happens not only for your own pain, but even when dealing with other people's pain. Um, you know, we have lots of experience where part of the work that uh, Matt and I have done previously is you're doing kind of somatic uh, trauma uh, discharge. And if you're working on somebody who has uh, that type of tension and pain that's being brought to the surface and released, and you feel sorry for them and you judge it as something bad, you can very, very much take it into yourself as a tangible physical pain for yourself. I've seen people like walking on somebody doing like a walking massage on somebody's legs and then they finish and they start to walk away and they get this big spasm in their leg and they crash to the ground because they're now experiencing basically what they took out of the guy because they were judging and feeling sorry for the person while they were doing it. Um, so this is... Uh, this comes up a lot in a lot of different forms, but it's always some form of judgment, right? Whether it's your pain, physical, emotional, or somebody else's, doesn't matter. We have one question from Christy, and then I'm going to suggest we end it because people are dropping off and it's getting late. So, Christy. Hi there. So, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Perfectly. Awesome. Yes. So I just wanted to say that um, I, I dealt with some of this pain just yesterday. So. I, uh, I'm really glad this topic came up and I took a lot of good notes. And yeah. um, and I also added to my own list, um, for me, when I deal with this level of pain, I try to keep it in the moment. Um, I try to make sure that it's not 
that I'm not taking it into the past or the future. And mm-hmm. I'm not letting a story come spring from it. It's kind of some of the same things you guys said with identification, yeah. but in my own words, it's about keeping it in the moment that I, I, um, I just, you know, let it be there and, yeah, and keep it is, from wiggling away from me. Into yeah. The, as into soon the as future. You, yeah. That's really, this is a really good point. As soon as you start to imagine, you know, uh, oh no, you know, about the future that this is going to lead to something else, or this is going to lead to something else. Uh, exactly. This is, um, yeah, or or you connect it to the past and start judging that. See, I'm here because exactly. I did this or I did that or I failed to do this or that or so on. Those are all, yeah, forms of judgment. So, yeah, yeah. See, they're all related, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we yeah. have a list of all these things, but they're all they're all connected in different ways. Yeah, judgment and and uh, identification. Yes, and uh, and all that. So yes, thank you for sharing that. That was going to be my question about. It, my question was basically what to do if we encounter just a, an emotional crisis. Um, and I, I, I describe them as emotional storms. I live here in Orlando and yeah. it'll just like pour cats mm-hmm. and dogs for five minutes and it'll be fine. The sun will come out. So yeah. I think of it just like that. They, they pass, good. like you said, with the impermanence. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah, watch and see and remember that they all pass. Exactly. Wow. It's good. Well, thank Wonderful. you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Looks really dark where you are, Paul. I'm sorry you had to sit in the car the whole time to partake in this. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, getting dark here. It is looking dark. Yeah. Probably dark in Florida, too. <laughs> well, everyone, uh, there are Issa, David, and Kristen. Your silence was profoundly uh, satisfying. Thank you all. I think um, for those remaining here, um, while there's no absolutely clear topic um, for next month, we're talking, uh, Matthew suggests, well, we've talked about mind. Let's talk about body next time, which uh, could include pain and even that the body dies or doesn't die or who knows what where it might lead to. There's... <laughs> um, but uh, thank you all, and uh, have a good dinner if you haven't eaten yet, and see you all next month. Thanks thank you, you Matt. Thank thanks, you. Chris. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Thanks to thank both of you guys, or thank all of you. Thank you. Really thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And Come we'll on. get a, a permanent link set up, okay? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.